were there any markets that gave you the most surprises? When we were launching in Australia, we went in knowing that there was another competitor. And it wasn't just a normal competitor, it was a formidable one. All markets we had combined at that time was smaller than that one competitor at, at that point of time. And they were just purely focused on Australia. But I think we were very clear on like what were the things that we could do uh, to beat uh, it and win in that market. So the first one was we were very focused on the device that we were going for. The competitor had a very good website, uh, but not uh, was not strong on the app. In two years time, actually one year plus, they were able to, to take down that competitor and Shopback became the number one player in, in Australia. If you really create a good user experience, uh, it's very likely that users would choose you. Welcome to The Pitch by Garage, a Business Times podcast where we deep dive into startups and tech and learn key business building skills from founders, business leaders, and experts. Today, I'm excited to have a conversation with Joel, the co-founder of Shopback. Thank you for joining me, Joel. Thanks for having me. So tell me more about yourself first. So we started this in 2014. Um, six of us, we, we quit our jobs, came together and started that. And since then, Shopback is in 13 different markets. We've also launched online cashback, we've had Shopback Pay, and we've recently partnered with Hula to have to go into the buy now pay later space. So I think it's exciting times, but I would say the journey started since 2014. Shopback have been uh, expanding the financial services mm. functions quite a fair bit, uh, going from payments and then buy now with pay later. Was that something that you already planned going into the whole financial services sector from day one? So when we started this, we didn't think about whether we were a fintech company or not. The goal really was to be customer first. And we tried to understand what would make a customer want to use our product. So the first one was uh, we gave them rewards so that we could incentivize them to shop more and to spend more at our merchant partners. Then afterwards, we tried to understand how can we make that cus customer experience better, especially for shopping. We want to be able to help you discover new brands, discover new products. So when someone goes to F&B outlet, he's able to use Shopback Pay to pay more easily and to earn rewards. Then on the retail side, we want to be able to help them split them to three different payments so that they are able to better manage their money and also better manage their, their shopping as well. So maybe going into buy now, pay later, what if this caused new challenges for the merchants, like example, cash flow issues? I think the most important part is that for buy now, pay later, the risk is actually fully on, on, on Shopback, right? So I think we want to be able to help merchants to be able to reach out to these customers. We do have a lot of shoppers already on the platform. So it's an additional benefit that we add on to them. And the goal is really, how can we make this seamless and easy for customers? Because uh, we are only paid when a customer makes a purchase. So we're very clear about that. We're, we're not here to bring clicks only. We're here to bring a sale. And for a sale to happen, it needs to be a very seamless experience because that will increase the conversion rate, both for us as well as, uh, as for the merchant. Now, tell me more about the acquisition of Hula. Uh, what was the intention behind that and why Hula? We are currently already driving a lot of demand uh, to merchants. In fact, if you look at just MAUs for all these uh, standalone buy now pay players, Shopback would definitely be number one based on app any, right, by far, right? So then we are thinking, how can we use these MAUs that we have and users and drive them over to merchants and close the loop? We really want to try to work together with a partner that believes in that. So we met the Hula team. Uh, they bought into the idea as well, whereby we want to create the Shopback 2.0. Users don't just get rewarded. Uh, it's a delightful experience, but also shopping becomes accessible for more people. And when we add that together, we think that we could build something much bigger. So it seems like financial players are going into shopping and retail, and then retail and shopping, e-commerce are going into financial services. What does it mean for your positioning? The pie is so big that it's enough space for everybody. So even when we look at Shopback Pay, I think we're partnering with the credit cards, we're partnering with GrabPay, all, all these are our partners. And what we do is we work with them so that they can help reach out to our customers and vice versa. So the end goal is really not to say, uh, you know, I want to compete with everyone else. The, the end goal really goes back to the customer, right? What are the methods they would like to use? Which are the partners they like to, they like to see us partner with? Shopback is now in 13 different markets. So what are some of the key learning points 
that you have learned in your journey in scaling across to this certain uh, market so far? In retrospect, I, I would say that first thing we, we, we would do is really look out for similarities between the markets. And then we try to fit in the business model for them. And once we have a stable model running there, then we can go deeper and say, hey, um, where are the pointers that we want to tweak and, and change and localize it for each market? So I'll give you an example. Uh, so online cashback is something that we use across the markets. But the way we cash out for different markets might be different. Mm -hmm. So in Singapore, it's very used to cashing out to bank transfers or even to PayPal. In markets like Indonesia, uh, bank accounts might not be open to everybody. So we allow cash outs into, for example, their mobile phone reloads called PUSA. So this will allow them to cash it out to their mobile phone credits and they can use it without having to access a bank account. Another one would be maybe on devices or, or platforms. So some markets in Southeast Asia are very dominant on the app. So we're very focused on how can we make our app uh, directly integrate with, with their app. However, in other markets like in Australia and Taiwan, whereby the web uh, or mobile web is actually quite dominant, then it might be a very different story. Were there any markets that gave you the most surprises? When we were launching into Australia, we went in knowing that there was another competitor. And it wasn't just a normal competitor, it was a formidable one. All markets we had combined at that time was smaller than that one competitor at, at that point of time. And they were just purely focused on Australia. But I think we were very clear on like what were the things that we could do uh, to beat uh, it and win in that market. So the first one was we were very focused on the device that we were going for. The competitor had a very good website, uh, but not uh, was not strong on the app. In two years' time, actually one year plus, they were able to, to take down that competitor and Shopback became the number one player in, in Australia. If you really create a good user experience, uh, it's very likely that users would choose you. In Southeast Asia, we see quite a fair bit of other cashback players as well. What are some of the key challenges and how did you manage to successfully grow Shopback even faster than your competitors? Ideas are free. So we cannot rely on a new idea being the only differentiator between us and our competitors. So whatever we're doing, we have to accept that competitors would copy that idea. Where I think there is a clear barrier to entry is on two fronts. One is that we already have a ready pool of users. If you just look at Singapore, we've been here for almost seven years. The users have been using us for quite a long time. And when we add a new service, um, it also tags along that credibility we've been working with them for, for, for so long, right? So it's much easier for them that they don't have to install a new app. They don't have to do all these uh, signups and stuff like that because they already have an account with Shopback. Secondly, the other one that we want to put a lot of emphasis on is really on the user experience. When all things are equal, then the user goes for the path of least resistance. And for us, it's really about how can we make it really smooth for them? Why not use us you know, to end the journey, right? We could allow you to use the cashback you've accumulated to pay, to net off the, the transaction. So when you have users and user experience and you put them together, I think that's really a formidable uh, barrier to entry. I would say it's a very competitive uh, space out there, but I think we're confident based on what we have that it's a leg up and a good barrier to entry. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really had a good time chatting with you about Shopback and your growth journey as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Now comes the time when I invite an expert to share his take on key lessons from Joel, draw practical insights and share with us what we can expect next. Right now, I have with me Varun Mittal, Chief Growth Officer of SingLife with Aviva. Hi, Varun. Hi, Renessa. So what do you think Shopback has done right? to command such a valuation and skill beyond other cashback players in this region? It's a very winner-takes-all kind of category industry. Uh, think from a merchant perspective. A merchant cannot run these kind of cashback promotions with 10 different platforms or 20 different platforms because then it becomes impossible for a merchant to track, evaluate, and see what's working. So there is a limited bandwidth from a merchant's perspective to look at how many players they will partner. And you have to also look at it from a customer perspective. A customer cannot have 10 apps to, to go for coupons and cashbacks. So you have a two-sided effect which creates consolidation towards a couple of companies to become winners. And then if you continue to execute well, uh, you start to come up to the top. So when should retail businesses like the big marketplaces start to think about integrating financial services and how should they go about it? One of the examples of... Uh, a lifestyle company expanding to financial services recently was when Shopback acquired Hula. They have 
natural synergies because Shopback has a lot more merchants, both online and offline. And uh, Hula has the buy now, pay later capabilities, which Shopback did not have off the shelf. So it's a good match. Both get ability to access each other's distribution, product capabilities, and scale together to bring a new capability to existing captive distribution base to unlock value and make life simpler for consumers as well as merchants. So that's a kind of expansion which creates value for everybody in the value chain. Thank you so much, Varun, for your insights. Thank you, Vanessa. It was great, wonderful talking to you. I hope you have enjoyed today's episode and learned valuable lessons on business building and growth. If you have enjoyed this episode, give us a like, hit share, comment, and hit subscribe for more episodes on startups and tech. My name is Vanessa Ho, and this has been The Pitch by Garage. Stay safe and entrepreneurial. I got